Um, the sub uh, come to order, um, a quorum being present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to this afternoon's hearing entitled, Why Don't They Just Get In Line? Barriers to Legal Immigration. I'd like to remind members that we've established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members want to offer as part of our hearing today. If members would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has previously been distributed to your offices and circulation of the materials to members and staff will be made as quickly as, as possible. I'd like to ask all members to mute their microphones when you're not speaking to prevent feedback and other technical issues. And you can unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. Finally, before we begin, I ask unanimous consent that our Judiciary Committee colleague, the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, be permitted uh, to participate in today's subcommittee hearing. Following the committee's practice, Ms. Ross will be allowed to question the witnesses if she is yielded time by one of the members of the subcommittee. And I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. I'd like to welcome our witnesses and the members of the Immigration and Citizenship Subcommittee to today's hearing on barriers to legal immigration. Today, we'll explore the question, why don't they just get in line? For many, that question can be answered in one of two ways. For some, there simply is no line. And for others, the line is so long that they will never get to the front. The framework for our legal immigration system dates back to 1952 and 1965 and was last updated more than 30 years ago. In 1990, Congress established the worldwide numerical limits on immigrant visas that still exist today, as well as the so-called per country cap, which further limits the number of visas that can be issued to nationals of any single foreign state. This outdated framework is now failing our nation. Over the past three decades, the worldwide limits and per country cap have led to wait times that were unimaginable in 1990. Today, an estimated 3.8 million individuals are waiting for a family-based immigrant visa, while approximately 1 million individuals wait for employment-based visas. Because of the per-country cap, the wait times are particularly long for individuals for countries with higher populations and higher demand for visas, such as India, China, and Mexico. For example, today it takes 23 years for an unmarried son or daughter of a U.S. citizen to receive a visa if they come from Mexico. As most family-based immigrants wait outside the United States for their visas to become available, families are forced to remain apart for decades. While most employment-based immigrants wait for a visa in the United States, the hardships associated with the backlog are different but still significant. The per-country cap has had a huge impact on families from India and China who are stuck in the backlog the longest, even though a person's nationality has nothing to do with their merit as an employee. For example, prospective employment-based immigrants can't switch jobs without a new employer agreeing to file a petition on their behalf. With limited mobility, this can expose workers to substandard working conditions or prevent them from advancing up the professional ladder. <clears throat> Further, the children of employment-based immigrants who turn 21 before they reach the front of the line age out of dependent status and often green card eligibility. Despite growing up here to remain, they must independently qualify for status on their own. If they're unable to do so, they must return to a country that is quite literally foreign to them. On top of these very significant limitations, laws passed in 1996 <clears throat> that were intended to crack down on uh, unlawful immigration by forcing those without status to return home have instead accomplished the opposite. IRCA established new bars to admissibility, creating a difficult, a difficult catch-22 situation for many who become eligible for a green card but have accumulated uh, unlawful presence. Certain individuals, including some spouses of U.S. citizens, are ineligible to apply for a green card in the United States and instead must depart and apply to U.S. consulate abroad. But it is the act of departing itself that triggers the bar for unlawful presence 
which can keep families apart for at least three or 10 years, and in some cases permanently. Not surprisingly, rather than risk a lengthy separation, many families have instead chosen to remain together in the U.S., according to a new report from the Pew Research Center. As of 2017, undocumented immigrants have lived in the United States an average of 15 years, up from just seven in 1995. Uh, AIRA also made changes to restrict the discretion of immigration judges and adjudicators, making our immigration laws even less flexible. Some bars to admissibility can't be waived at all, even if the individual was very young when the act occurred or lacked the knowledge or intent to violate the law. Laws that completely close off re relief, regardless of the underlying circumstances, don't protect our country and impose needless hardships on American families by keeping them apart or their loved ones uh, forever in the shadows. Uh, as lawmakers, it's incumbent upon us to fix those laws that don't well serve the United States. Uh, I think that there are many aspects of these dated immigration laws that simply do not well serve the United States of America, nor do they necessarily serve the purposes for which uh, they were introduced. And I'll just give an example of the three and 10 year bar. I remember the discussion so well. I was a member of this committee at the time, as was uh, our uh, chairman and uh, my colleague, Sheila Jackson Lee. Elton Galligley, a then a congressman from California, and Lamar Smith, then a congressman from Texas, uh, promoted the idea of the three and 10 year bar as an effective uh, remedy to um, unpermitted entry to the United States. Uh, it was only directed at those who were not inspected, did not apply to those who overstayed their visa. We know because from 1995 to today, uh, there has been massive uh, uninspected entry to the United States, that this effort uh, to prevent that has simply failed. It serves no purpose today other than to frustrate the law itself, which promotes American citizens being able to petition uh, for their uh, husbands and wives. It's now my pleasure to recognize a ranking member of the subcommittee, gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, for his opening statement. Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, to recall on March 4th, the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, along with all six Republican members of this subcommittee, uh, wrote to you requesting a hearing on the border crisis caused by President Biden's decision to stop the NPP program, abandon the border wall, and is twice not to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. Um, we received no response. On March 12th, I reiterated that request to you in a subsequent letter. Again, no response. I wish to make that request to you once again. Uh, the situation is deteriorating rapidly, and the implications for every American community uh, that will soon see its, its school impacted by non-English speaking students its hospital emergency rooms filled with illegal aliens demanding basic health services, uh, and its safety compromised as, as gangs proliferate uh, and as criminal illegal aliens are, are released into our neighborhoods uh, rather than to be deported. Worse than ignoring this crisis, the majority seems to be working overtime to make it worse. In the last few weeks, the House has moved legislation to make it harder to keep terrorists out of the country and harder to stop illegal drugs, weapons, and other contraband from reaching our, uh, reaching our ports of entry. And now we're holding this hearing aimed at flooding the labor market with low-wage labor just at the time when Amer working Americans are, are trying to regain the prosperity that they were enjoying under the Trump policies. Those policies secured our border and for the first time in decades. The income gap of between rich and poor began to narrow as blue collar wages surged. Uh, unemployment reached its lowest rate in 50 years. Uh, the poverty rate plunged to its lowest rate in 60 years. And um, wages recorded their strongest growth in 40 years. The labor participation rate began to increase after decades of decline as American workers who've given up hope of work began seizing opportunities. So I hope the majority will listen very carefully to Mr. Law's testimony. 
He'll tell us how flooding the market with low-wage labor does enormous economic hardworking Americans. Uh, he destroys the myth that programs like the H-1B and H-2B uh, visas uh, fill gaps in the American labor market. What they actually do is to allow employers to fill positions at wages substantially less than the domestic labor market would otherwise demand. Wealthy corporate interests get richer by paying less than the Americans require to do these jobs. Immigrant labor gets paid more than they could get in their own countries. And all of this at the expense of working Americans whose wages stagnated for decades as the immigrant share of the population tripled. As Mr. Law points out, it is the blue collar American workers who lose and lose big. I particularly want to note this passage from his testimony. There are no jobs Americans won't do. There are only wages and working conditions that they are not willing to accept for the work, nor should they. By refusing to offer higher wages or conditions to entice Americans to come to work for them, employers create a mirage of a labor shortage and point to importing foreign workers as the only solution. Circling back to supply and demand, employers want to flood the market with labor supply to drive down wages. That's the game that they're playing. Of particular note is the optional practical training program that allows foreign students to work here for three years after graduation. Unlike their American classmates, they're exempt from payroll taxes, making them much cheaper than American graduates to hire. If your family's recent college graduate can't find work, there's a simple reason. It's not that these policies put foreign workers at parity with American workers. They put American workers at a considerable disadvantage, competing for jobs and market wages in their own country. And it's their own representatives that are doing this. The crisis at the border, I think, is beginning to awaken Americans that their futures are very much at stake. Their simple ability to make it in their own country is now being jeopardized by the officials that they trusted. I think it's why some of my colleagues would rather virtue signal to each other about their charity for strangers in a strange land than to fix our open border and relax immigration laws so that we can restore the American dream for American families. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chairman of the uh, committee, Mr. Nadler, is now recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. In today's hearing, we explore an aspect of our immigration system that is of great importance to the millions of U.S. citizens and aspiring Americans, barriers to legal immigration. It's important to remember that the immigration debate in this country does not start and stop at the southern border. We won't fix the system if we simply pump more money into border security or an ineffective wall. To truly fix the system, we must update the legal immigration framework and restore discretion to forge pathways to permanent residence and meet the needs of our country today. Currently, more than 1 million individuals are stuck in the employment-based immigrant visa backlog, and nearly 4 million are waiting for a family-based visa. These backlogs exist and have grown longer each year because our legal immigration system has been frozen in time since 1990. The impact of these long wait times can be devastating, particularly for those from high demand countries who wait the longest. For example, today it takes nearly 25 years for certain family-based immigrants to receive a visa. That's a quarter of a century that many families must endure while separated from their loved ones. Many employment-based immigrants must wait well over a decade to reach the front of the immigrant visa line. Although most of these individuals live and work in the United States, on temporary visas during that time, life-changing events can have serious consequences. For example, if the principal immigrant dies before a visa becomes available, a risk that has become all too real during the COVID-19 pandemic, the family members will lose their temporary status and be forced to leave the United States. Similarly, children who turn 21 before reaching the, age, the front of the green card line age out of eligibility for dependent status and must find a way to qualify for status on their own. Our immigration laws are also particularly harsh for thousands of US citizens whose spouses and children are virtually shut out of the system with no means of obtaining lawful status because of provisions that restrict or provide no discretionary waivers of inadmissibility or deportability and that provide arcane law bars for unlawful presence. Because of policies like these, 
Far too many families have been needlessly and cruelly separated for years. For example, my constituent, Dr. Kevin Kells, has lived apart from his wife for over 15 years. In 1998, before they met, Dr. Kell's wife traveled to the United States to attend a high school graduation party. She did not speak English, but the driver of her car told the border officer that she was born in the United States. The record now shows that she made a false claim to U.S. citizenship, and she is permanently barred from the United States. For Dr. Kells and his wife, there is no line to obtain a green card or legal status. Nor are there options for many others, given the limited discretion of immigration judges and officers to waive the consequences of past acts, even those that were based on honest mistakes made decades ago. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the impacts of the outdated immigration system and the reforms that are needed to ensure the system works for, not against, American families and businesses. I thank the Chair, Ms. Lofgren, for her leadership on this issue and for holding this important hearing. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. It's my understanding that the ranking member, Mr. Jordan, uh, does not wish to make an opening statement. If that's incorrect, he should speak up now. Uh, if not, we will certainly uh, welcome his submission of a statement for the record. <clears throat> and it's now my pleasure to introduce today's witnesses. Uh, John Yang is the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. In 1997, Mr. Yang co-founded the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to addressing the needs of Asian Pacific Americans in the D.C. metropolitan area. Previously, Mr. Yang was a partner with the law firm Wiley Rain LLP and worked in Shanghai, China for a U.S. Fortune 200 company. Mr. Yang received his JD from George Washington University Law School. David Beer uh, is a research fellow for immigration studies at the Cato Institute, a nonpartisan public policy research organization. Mr. Beer has nearly a decade of immigration policy research working with the Niskanen Center and the Competitive, Competitive Enterprise Institute in addition to the Cato Institute. From 2013 to 2015, Mr. Beer served as a senior policy advisor for Congressman Raul Labrador, then a member of this uh, committee and later chair of this subcommittee. Poreen Matre is a student of biomedical engineering at the University of Iowa. Ms. Matre came to the United States when she was four months old as a dependent on her mother's student visa and has lived here ever since with her parents. Last month, Ms. Matre turned 21 and aged out of her H-4 status. Because of the immigrant visa backlog, she is now at risk of separation from both her family and the only country she has ever known. And finally, Robert Law, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Policy for the Center for Immigration Studies. From 2017 to 2021, Mr. Law served first as Senior Policy Advisor and later as Chief of Office Policy and Strategy at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and a JD from the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law. Now, we welcome all of our distinguished uh, witnesses. We thank them for participating in today's hearing. And as is customary, I would like to swear in all our witnesses. Uh, please, uh, each of you, turn on your video and audio and make sure I can see your face and your raised right hand while I administer the oath. Do you swear uh, under penalty or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Please say yes. Yes, I do. And it's noted that all of our witnesses have taken uh, this oath. Please note that your testimony, um, your full written statement will be made part of the record in its entirety. And we do accordingly uh, ask you to summarize your testimony in about five minutes. And to help you uh, keep track of that time, there's a timer on your screen. And we ask that you be attentive 
two. We will begin uh, with you, Mr. Yang. Please uh, help us with your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member McClintock, uh, Committee Chair Nadler, and all of the members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify before all of you. A Asian Americans are acutely aware of the injustice of living in and contributing to the United States economy and society, but always being treated as a so-called perpetual foreigner. This concept has been enshrined in our laws at different times with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the incarceration of Americans of Japanese descent during World War II. As such, we advocate for citizenship for all people who live and work permanently here in the United States. And it should not be lost that two thirds of the Asian American population here in the United States are immigrants. That of our immigrants, about 75% of the Asian American immigrants in recent years come through based on family-based family based visas. And that about 40% of the current immigrants to the United States come from Asia. Now, these immigrants come through family-based system. Others do, did come through the humanitarian, employment-based, or diversity visas, and then they sponsor family members. The family system creates a built-in safety net for new immigrants. Those who came before them help new immigrants' relatives find housing and jobs, learn English, successfully navigate a foreign system to them, and eventually become United States citizens and participate in our democracy. Together, families pool capital and labor to buy homes, start businesses, and create jobs. Immigrants accounted for 30% of all new entrepreneurs in 2014, despite only comprising only 13% of the United States population. Caretakers, who are predominantly women, do unpaid and undervalued work that enables their family members to work outside the home. But our system is also in need of serious reform. There are three basic answers to the question in the title of today's hearing, which is why don't they just get in line? And some of this has been answered. First, there's simply no line for some of our immigrants. Many undocumented people and non-immigrant visa holders simply do not qualify for any existing immigrant pathways, even though they were invited here by our government or they are here out of status through no fault of their own. There are very few employment visas available for lesser skilled workers in labor markets that desperately need workers and even those with a college degree. Second, many immigrants are in line, but those lines are far too long and snake around several blocks. There are around 4 million recorded family members in line for green cards under the family-based system, even though that system, as a practical matter, only has approximately 226,000 family-based visas allocated per year. The employment-based system is no different. As several members noted, there are approximately 1 million people waiting in that backlog, even though there are only about 140,000 employment-based visas allocated per year. Years of bureaucratic processing delays, these low numerical limits, country caps, and Congress's inability to act and update the system to keep up with population growth and labor market needs has resulted in these extreme backlogs in the green card programs, and some families wait for decades to be reunited with their loved ones. Look, and let's be clear, such long family separations are harmful to families. People make life choices, including foregoing marriages or education while they wait in these lines, if they have a line at all. They have children abroad who could have started their education here in the United States rather than transitioning at an older age. These, these delays are contrary to U.S. interests, and where possible, we should encourage them to immigrate in their youth so they can invest in English, education, and job skills to be, to be successful. Over half of the 1.1 million new green cards issued annually go to people that are already living in the United States. And the U.S. has not updated the family-based immigration system nor increased the annual number allocation in over 30 years, despite the fact that our U.S. population has increased and is aging. And it's not lost on us that the Census Bureau just yesterday announced that we had the lowest growth here in the United States since the 1930s at 7.4%. So in order for our population to grow and survive and prosper, we do need more immigrants in the system. Finally, undocumented immigrants face other barriers to adjusting their status. There are estimated 1.4 million undocumented immigrants with U.S. citizen or uh, legal permanent resident spouses and 3.4 million undocumented immigrants with a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident child. Finally, they face barriers to inadmissibility, as was noted, the most notable of being the three-year and 10-year bars. 
The solution is easy, and that's why Advancing Justice AJC advocates for the passage of Congresswoman Chu's Reuniting Families Act, Congresswoman Linda Chavez's, Sanchez's U.S. Citizenship Act, in whole or in part, to solve these problems. These provisions will create reasonable lines that we need to ensure a vital America in the future. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Uh, now we would be happy to invite uh, Mr. Beer for your testimony. Welcome. Sarah Lofgren, Ranking Member McClintock, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity. After having worked as senior policy advisor for a member and vice chair of this important subcommittee, it is an honor to be invited back to explain the challenges that America's legal immigrants face. The simple answer to the question that this hearing poses, why don't immigrants get in line, is that immigrants cannot legally get into line, that is, apply for legal permanent residence on their own. U.S. legal immigration is based almost exclusively on selection or sponsorship by the U.S. government, U.S. families, employers, or other sponsors. Thus, the question could be restated. Why can't Americans let immigrants get into the line? And the answer to this question is that the government effectively bans us from doing so. Today, the only immigrants who can immigrate permanently from abroad without numerical limits are the spouses, minor children, and parents sponsored by adult U.S. citizens. All other permanent immigration from abroad is either capped or illegal. And the four capped categories aren't realistic options for nearly all would-be immigrants. First is the diversity visa lottery, which selects 55,000 immigrants from a pool of generally over 20 million applicants, a 0.2% chance. Second is the refugee program, which currently selects just 15,000 refugees from nearly 20 million refugees worldwide. Even worse odds. Third, other family-sponsored categories for only the closest relatives of U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents. And here the CAPS have created a backlog of nearly 4 million applicants with many new applicants facing near 100-year wait times. Fourth, employer-sponsored immigration. Foreign employees also face a hard cap, also set by Congress in 1990, and half of that cap ends up being used by their spouses and minor children. Indian immigrants bear nearly the full burden of the low overall employer-sponsored caps as a result of the per-country caps, which limit immigrants from any single birthplace to no more than 7% of the green cards issued. Indians are about half the applicants, which means they end up being about 90% of those in the backlog. At the current rate of issuances, it would take a new Indian applicant applying today with a master's degree or less at least 84 years to receive a green card. During this time, nearly 200,000 Indians already in line today would die waiting, even assuming that they could stay in line that long. Another 100,000 of their minor children already waiting with them right now will age out of eligibility for green cards based on their parents' application when they turn 21 and lose their chance at permanent residence altogether. Even if you're not from India, it's effectively impossible to obtain employer sponsorship for permanent residence while you're not already in the country. This is because the government takes between two and three years to process a case abroad. That's far too long to fill an open position. And the result is that almost all employer-sponsored immigrants must first obtain an H-1B temporary work visa, come here and work for their employers while the permanent residence process unfolds. This is challenging for workers with college degrees because the cap on the H-1B visa is just 85,000 and employers petitioned for about 275,000 applicants last year. But for workers without a college degree, it's effectively impossible. There's no year-round temporary work visa for them at all. So they are shut out. And that is it. Four options to obtain permanent residence from abroad, and none are realistic for those crossing the border. When immigration is illegal, no one can claim surprise at illegal immigration. The U.S. immigration system is far more constrained today than in its past. Before 1924, the U.S. allowed an annual rate of legal immigration as a share of its population 
more than double any recent year. Many years during that time, the rates were five times higher. But that was when the U.S. system had a viable line that most immigrants were presumptively eligible for. Today, we have few eligible categories, arbitrary caps, and endless waits. We can do better. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Matre. Ms. Matre, you are welcome to uh, join us with your statement uh, for five minutes. Chairman Nadler, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member McClintock, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you today. My name is Perrine Matre. I'm currently a third year biomedical engineering student minoring in business administration at the University of Iowa. I'm also a member of Improve the Dream, a youth-led advocacy, advocacy organization bringing awareness for more than 200,000 children of long-term visa holders who face self-deportation, even though we have grown up in the United States with a documented status. I am one of these children. I am a documented dreamer. I was born in India and my parents brought me to Cincinnati, Ohio when I was four months old in August 2000 as a dependent on my mother's student visa. After a year, we moved to Iowa City, Iowa. My parents completed multiple degrees at the University of Iowa and both parents started to work for the university. My status changed to an H-4 dependent visa in 2008 and my parents' employer filed for a green card in 2012. I was enrolled in the Iowa City Community School District from K through 12. Having lived in this country for virtually my whole life, my roots are here in Iowa and I am a Midwesterner. As I grew up, I volunteered for many organizations in my community, including the public library and the local hospital. I've been part of teams that have competed in various STEM and student journalism competitions at both state and national levels. During my time at school, at every step of the way, I formed relationships with teachers and students that have had a lifelong impact on me. Mrs. Reby in elementary school guided me to lead. Mr. Norton in middle school gave me the confidence in my math skills that would allow me to choose engineering as my major. And Mr. Gross in high school encouraged me to speak, to speak up on unjust issues. Over the past 21 years, my parents and I have received help and love from many wonderful people of this country, and we are very grateful for it. At the same time, our hearts break when we think of my future immigration status and that of many other documented dreamers. Due to the uncertainty of my situation, I have been in constant fear for the past five years. Despite living here my whole life and having very literally grown up on my university campus, I am considered an international student. After spending nearly my entire life here, I am encountering the same hurdles as newly arrived international students. I am now a junior at the University of Iowa. My future goal is to work in the STEM field to contribute to advancements in medical devices. However, due to my status, the inability to obtain internships has limited me in terms of acquiring the professional experiences for my goals. For the past nine months, I've been awaiting approval for the change of status to F1 student. I also turned 21 less than two weeks ago, so I no longer have dependent status. I aged out of the system. Unless my application is approved, I am not allowed to enroll in classes in future semesters. As a result of these barriers and the daily worry of my situation, I have been diagnosed with clinical depression, generalized anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. I've been seeing a therapist for more than a year because I've reached a point where I could not cope alone and I needed help. If my application is denied, I will be immediately out of status and will need to self-deport. My family will be torn apart and our American dream will vanish, even though I am an Iowan and American at heart. Even if my application is approved, the odds are against people like me. After completing my education, I would need to obtain my own H-1B visa to be able to but only 31% of applicants were selected in 2020. And even after going through the entire employment-based green card process, I will be at the back of the line. People say, just get in line and apply for citizenship. But the truth is, there is no viable line for me and the thousands of documented dreamers. My journey might sound unique, but more than 200,000 children share my story. Anug will age out and face self-deportation in nine months. Huddy will face self-deportation in seven months. Trishti will face self-deportation in five months. The members of Improve the Dream are grateful for our voice being recognized with our inclusion in the recently passed Dream and Promise Act. 
Chairwoman Lofgren, we are extremely thankful to you for this positive change and hope that going forward, all solutions for dreamers will include documented dreamers like us. However, we hope that this committee will also work to permanently end aging out and address the root causes of this issue. Chairman Nadler, Chairwoman Lofgren, and Ranking Member McClintock, and the members of the subcommittee, please consider the thousands of children and families who have had hopes in pursuing the American dream, but are being torn apart despite maintaining a documented status. This land of the free, this beautiful and generous nation is our home. I hope you can improve the dream for all of us who only want a chance at the American dream. Thank you so much for your time today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Matre, and we will actually make a, an inquiry of the department about the status of your application. I don't understand why you have not heard back, so hopefully uh, that will help get an answer to you. Uh, now we will turn to Mr. Law for your five minutes of testimony. Welcome, sir. Thank you. While the topic of our nation's lawful immigration system and the impact it has on the wages and job opportunities for Americans is an important one, a sovereign nation must enforce the laws on the books, otherwise the rules become moot. The ongoing and worsening crisis at the southern border should temper consideration of any expansive legal immigration reforms. The United States is the greatest country in the world, so it is unsurprising that billions of people from around the globe would relocate to America if they could. This presents a binary policy choice, either allow unlimited immigration or set annual numerical limits. Unlimited immigration is not feasible and numerical limits or caps are not barriers, but instead the rules under which our legal immigration system operates. Because the American people are the true stakeholders in US immigration policy, the system should not operate in a way that harms American workers. Every year, the United States awards 1 million new green cards and allows in approximately 700,000 temporary foreign workers, generally without any analysis of whether or not there is any significant economic or labor need. There's ample evidence that the current high levels of legal immigration, both permanent and temporary, negatively affect the wages and opportunities for certain Americans. With our predominantly family-based immigration system, only about 15% of green cards are awarded in a given fiscal year on the basis of merit. The result is that an overwhelming number of immigrants, including those who subsequently become naturalized US citizens, are less educated and lower skilled than the general native born American population. Though this is not a reason to cast a negative light on any of these aliens, we should, however, consider whether we are adequately addressing the problems of US citizens, education, unemployment, poverty, before welcoming even more people who are likely to struggle with the same issues. The oversupply of workers at the bottom of the labor market reduces wages and job opportunities for Americans at that level. Specifically, the Americans who lose out due to mass immigration tend to be those without a college degree including African-Americans and other minorities, the young and the disabled. These Americans are usually the last into the workforce during an economic boom and the first to be let go during economic downturns. On the other hand, lower wages translate to higher incomes for business executives and larger profits for corporations. The rich get richer, immigrants receive higher wages than they would for the same work in the home country, and lower skilled Americans disproportionately suffer. As the National Academy of Sciences found in 2016, the lower wages paid to immigrant workers translates to approximately $54 billion a year in lost income for marginalized American workers. Put another way, mass low-skilled immigration fuels income inequality and causes significant wealth transfer from blue-collar Americans. A common refrain from businesses and proponents of high levels of immigration is that our country needs immigrants because there are supposedly jobs that Americans will not do. The data clearly refutes that with only six of 474 unique occupations being majority immigrant. This flawed premise should be dispensed with as Chairman Nadler himself said during an October 2017 immigration bill markup. Or consider these words from Jared Bernstein, former chief economic advisor to then Vice President Biden, quote, Employers are very quick to raise the specter of a labor shortage, 
But often it's another way of saying they can't find the workers they want at the price they're paying. They are unwilling to meet the price signal the market is sending, so they seek help in the form of a spigot like immigration, end quote. Due to mass legal immigration, Pew reports that the real wages of non-college educated Americans have stagnated or declined over the past 40 years. It took a decade for wages of hourly workers to return to pre-Great Recession levels, and American workers across the board still have not recovered from the crippling effects of the economic downturn caused by COVID-19. It is not unreasonable to wonder if these marginalized Americans will ever recover with government policies that flood the labor market with cheap foreign labor. In closing, I note that the mid-1990s Jordan Commission, named after former Congresswoman and civil rights icon Barbara Jordan, warned about all of this. Quote, immigration policy must protect U.S. workers against unfair competition from foreign workers with an appropriately higher level of protection to the most vulnerable in our society. End quote. One last quote. The commission is particularly concerned about the impact of immigration on the most disadvantaged within our already resident society, inner city youth, racial and ethnic minorities, and recent immigrants who have not yet adjusted to life in the US, end quote. It is long past time for Congress to heed the recommendations of the Jordan Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of our witnesses for your testimony. Now is the time when members of the subcommittee uh, can ask uh, questions of the witnesses uh, for up to five minutes. I'll turn first to the ranking member, Mr. McClintock, for his questions. Mr. McClintock, you are recognized. Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Law, to hear the Democratic witnesses, immigration has slowed to a trickle. Yet you pointed out that currently the United States issues over one million green cards per year. Uh, and over 43 million aliens have obtained lawful permanent residency status since the 1965 Act. Uh, you point out in your written testimony that the number of immigrants in the United States has gone from 9.6 million in 1970 to 44.9 million in 2019, a nearly four and a half fold increase. You point out that the immigrant share of the U.S. population has nearly tripled over this time period from 4.7% to 13%. And that the United States admits more immigrants per year with a path to citizenship than the rest of the world combined. That doesn't sound like a trickle to me. What am I missing? Thank you, sir. No, the only the only trickle would, of course, be uh, this last year, which, uh, of course, the entire world shut down due to due to COVID-19. Uh, any suggestion otherwise that immigration has been, been shut out, um, more specifically within the Trump administration, is simply not true. Uh, during during the previous administration, legal immigration, meaning green cards, uh, continued to average just slightly over one million a year. That has been consistent with uh, more recent historical norms. Uh, any form of temporary worker programs, such as the aforementioned H-1B or H-2B programs, uh, those caps have been met. In fact, the uh, H-2B supplemental authority that Congress delegated uh, was utilized numerous times uh, by respective DHS secretaries. Uh, so it's just simply not true. It's it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that uh, legal immigration uh, was shut out um, at any time uh, in, under the Trump administration. We have heard about long waiting times. Now, I recall Gallup uh, polling. From their polling data, just in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are 42 million people wanting to come to the United States, let, let alone uh, from the rest of the world. Aren't the wait lists the natural consequence of the simple fact that not everybody who wants to come to the United States can come to the United States? Yes, thank you. You know, as I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we're, we're really posed with just two choices. You either have unlimited immigration, which our country legitimately cannot sustain. Our, our borders cannot contain the entire world's population. And as a great of a nation as we are, it's unsurprising that everybody would want to come here. We don't have the space and we certainly don't have the economy to cover everybody. Um, regarding the, the green card, so therefore we have respective limits that Congress has, has set in place. When there is a higher demand than there is the available amount of green cards, there is not a backlog as has been um, often mischaracterized. It is in fact a wait list. Um, that's exactly what that means. You have to wait until your number becomes available. 
a, a backlog suggests uh, basically government ineptitude in delayed processing. Uh, there's no amount of expeditious processing uh, that the government could do uh, to approve all of the green cars, particularly for what is called the oversubscribed nations. There is a limit that Congress has put in place. And for those who aren't able to get in because of those limits, they simply are, are just waiting uh, their, their turn. It's, it's not a backlog. It is a wait list. And that distinction is, I think, very critical. By the way, to understand. You mentioned that the, the per country cap on green cards. Without that, wouldn't it mean that the, the largest countries would then claim all the slots? I mean, isn't the per country cap designed to assure that citizens of every country have a shot at those slots? Absolutely. The, the 1952 immigration system had a, had a na national origin quota system that we did away with in, in the 1965 Act. Uh, having per country caps was a very, you know, I think, thoughtful decision that said we value diversity in our immigrant population. We don't want populous countries or large sending countries to capture all of the green cards at the expense of nationals from every other country in the world. Uh, in we, we heard, you know, recent time, go ahead. Right. Well, I was going to say, we heard one Democratic witness recommend that we start by removing the per country limits, but ultimately we should remove the worldwide limits all the world limits on family and employment-based immigration entirely. What would that mean for, for working American families? I mean, if we were to disregard all forms of immigration limits and the entire world's population came to the United States, there are very few Americans that would actually find themselves employed or certainly having the same types of wages and opportunities that they currently have. I mean, it's just simple supply and demand. And with respect to the per country caps, while it does appear just by a quick reading of the statute to be limited to 7%, there's actually uh, a carve out provision that when the lower sending countries don't utilize their allotment, higher sending countries do get more of that. Uh, when it comes to India, they're currently getting 25% of the green cards available in a given fiscal year. If you disregard per country caps, Indian nationals will take at least 90% of the green cards for the next decade. And what that means is, you don't have diversity in the immigrant population, and you've now injected weight to everybody else in the world just to cater to one particular population. I see my time's expired. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chairman of the committee, Mr. Nadler, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Byer. In 1996, Congress enacted what has become known as the three and 10 year bars. You discuss in your testimony how harsh these bars are, how limited the waivers are, and the impact they have on millions of individuals. Can you discuss in more detail just how these bars work and why in your view they need to be replaced? Thank you for that question. Uh, under the bars, anyone with a year of illegal presence in the United States cannot re-enter the country legally for 10 years. And this is essentially one of the most counterproductive enforcement measures that Congress has ever enacted. Uh, as a result of the bars, if someone is trying to get right with the law, and uh, that is, should be the goal of our immigration enforcement system, is that we should have a process for people to correct the mistakes that they made and uh, go home and, and uh, get an immigrant visa and come back. But under this system, you are barred even if you are eligible for status which means you have created an incentive in the law to continue to maintain illegal presence in this country and, and not return home and correct uh, your mistake. And so what we've seen is uh, people stay despite being eligible for a green card. Many of them end up being deported and then you're subject to a permanent bar on reentry. And then you have a situation today, right now, where Border Patrol is apprehending tens of thousands of parents of U.S. citizens who are crossing the border illegally, even though they could be eligible for a green card if not for uh, the bars that, uh, that the law subjects them to. So it, it has completely backfired, and it hasn't worked out at all has, how the authors of that law expected it to. Thank you, Mr. Yang. In your opening statement, you discussed the need to protect and reform family-based immigration, which has been the bedrock of our immigration system since 1965. Can you discuss some of the obstacles that U.S. citizens and green card holders face when they try to sponsor family members 
to our legal immigration system? Well, thank you for that question, Chairman Nadler. The main obstacle is with respect to the wait times. Because of the limited number of family-based visas that are available, family members end up United States citizens trying to sponsor family members, oftentimes wait several years, if not decades, for them to be able to bring over their family members. If you're talking about nationals from Mexico, Philippines, India, or China, those waits, or the Philippines, those waits could be upwards of 20 years or more. Now, why is that important? Because we want to unify family members here in the United States to, to provide that social safety network for those people to prosper. And those people are doing any sorts of different, oftentimes undervalued work to help Americans succeed in business, to help Americans create businesses, help Americans to innovate. That's why the family-based immigration system works, because it creates that entire network that values how our system is constructed and values all of these different pieces that aren't simply based on merit or based on existing wealth that would contribute to the American economy. Thank you. Ms. Matra, can you describe for the subcommittee what you want to do with your degree in biomedical engineering if you're able to stay in the United States and obtain a green card? Thank you for that question. Uh, like I stated, I would like to help improve the healthcare system by advancing medical devices. And most importantly, I want to give back to the community that has supported me and my family for the past almost 21 years now. Um, and I realized I wanted to do this because of my volunteering experience at the hospital. Um, I was not only exposed uh, to uh, the hospital environment, but also to the way physicians use uh, various types of equipment and devices to treat patients. And um, I want to use this experience and as well as my degree to help contribute to these advancements in the medical field and hopefully help increase the quality of life for patients and just be a productive member of the society. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Mr. Um, Buck would be next, but I think he's had to step away. So we will turn to Mr. Biggs for his uh, questions. Mr. Biggs, you're recognized. I thank uh, the chair for recognizing me and appreciate all our witnesses being here. Um, I am, however, um, once again disappointed that we're not having a hearing on the, the actual border crisis. While legal immigration is important to our country, the most important issue, in my opinion, that this subcommittee should be addressing is the border security. The current crisis was created by the Biden administration and our Democrat friends in Congress. President Biden had ended successful pro policies and programs that were put in place by the Trump administration and that brought the southern border under operational control generally. Democrats in Congress continue to promise amnesty to those who have broken our laws. They continue to provide incentives and draws for people from all over the world to enter our country illegally. When it comes to legal immigration, we're the most generous nation in the world. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, in fiscal year 2020, more than 700,000 people received a green card and more than 620,000 individuals were naturalized. In FY 2019, more than 1 million individuals received green cards and more than 840,000 individuals were naturalized. And in FY 2019, there were more than 186 million non-immigrant alien admissions to the United States. And that included over 440,000 H-2A visa admissions and over 129,000 H-2B admissions and over 1.8 million student admissions. And according to USCIS data, as of September 30, 2019, there were more than 583,000 aliens authorized to work in the United States in the H-1B visa classification. By any stretch of the imagination, by any rational look at this, you cannot say that the United States is squeezing out immigrants. Well, instead, we're the most generous nation in the world for immigration. So, Mr. Law, my first question is for you. What impact would reinstate the MPP? have on the current crisis? Thank you. MPP was one of the, or Remain in Mexico, as it is sometimes uh, referred to as, was one of the, the most visionary aspects of the Trump administration's efforts to control the border and deter fraudulent, frivolous, and otherwise non-meritorious asylum claims filed by economic migrants. 
the way that MPP works is if you have not, uh, if you do not have an, uh, if you are inadmissible, you must wait in Mexico if you are a non-Mexican until uh, you have your, your court hearing. The number one goal of economic migrants is to simply be let into the country, at which point they oftentimes disappear or in many cases are actually given work permits while they wait out um, their court their court dates, and very few of them actually meet the statutory requirement of the humanitarian protection that we call asylum. So MPP absolutely sh does control the border. So, so Mr. Law, how many aliens are currently in the United States waiting for their asylum claim to be adjudicated, either by USCIS or EOIR? Thank you. So it's my understanding, based off of the, the fiscal year 21 uh, refugee report that the State Department uh, submitted, uh, which takes into account and recognizes that our humanitarian efforts are both refugee from abroad and asylum uh, here at home, and we have to address both, that USCIS has approximately 598,000 asylum applications that they are dealing with, and that EOR, um, through the Department of Justice, has approximately 549,000 uh, on their docket. So what percentage of aliens who actually express fear at the border ultimately file an asylum claim? So this is an important point. The, the claiming of credible fear is tends to have been the ticket into the country. That does not mean that you are granted asylum. It just means you've met, met the first threshold. Once that claim has been made, only 62% are subsequently turning around and actually seeking asylum in, in this country. So in 20 year, the fiscal year 2020 through quarter three, um, what percentage actually uh, was adjudicated as having a credible fear claim? Uh, credible fear, I, I know, is, is a rather higher number, but then when you look at actual asylum grants, uh, which I think is the more important measure, it's only approximately 15%. Right, now that's, that's roughly right all the way back to uh, FY 2013. And what happens to those whose claims are not granted? Well, oftentimes they are uh, not removed from this country. They, they should be, but just given the, the sheer volume of it and the limited enforcement resources that ICE has, um, very, very few actually get removed. And, and that, again, just further complicates the system and just fuels the next caravan of, of economic migrants. Um, I see my time's expired. I thank the, the gentlelady. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, thank you. The gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Shara Paul, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you thank to you. our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I am here today as the only member of this committee to actually have been on an F-1 student visa. When I was 16 years old, my parents sent me by myself with their last $5,000 so that I could get the best education and the most opportunity here in the United States. It was a tremendous sacrifice for them and we still live on different continents. I spent a good chunk of my life on an alphabet soup of visas. After I graduated from college, I transitioned to a practical training visa and then back to a student visa for graduate school and then to an H-1B visa before eventually obtaining legal permanent residence status or a green card through marriage to a U.S. citizen. But my journey to citizenship, like so many other immigrants, was almost thwarted entirely by life. In 1995, I received a two-year fellowship to go back to my birth country of India. In order to maintain my green card, I had to return to the United States once a year. I carefully planned the timing so that I could return home to the United States for the final trimester of my pregnancy and be within those rules. But then I developed a leak in my amniotic sac that endangered the life of both me and my child. I had an emergency C-section at 26 and a half weeks in India and spent months at my child's bedside in the ICU, praying and doing everything I could for their survival. That also meant I was unable to return to the United States within my year window, and I lost my legal status, even though my husband and now my child were both U.S. citizens. The then Immigration and Naturalization Service was not concerned with the real-life decision I had, make, I had to make to stay in India for the safety of me and my child when it revoked my legal status, and it was only after enormous advocacy from my family and my fellowship that I was able to get my permanent resident status reinstated and re-enter the country with my family, only to have to start from scratch with my green card and wait another three years to get my citizenship. 
I, once I finally became a citizen after 17 years of living in the United States, I desperately wanted to bring my parents here to be with me and their grandchild. But they were elderly, and it was unfair to uproot them from their community, especially with the additional time it would take to join me through family sponsorship. I, I tell this story because it is really important that we think about how tough our immigration system is to navigate and how families are kept apart and how this story, just like the stories of our witnesses today, are just a few of the many stories that are out there. So Ms. Matra, thank you for being here today and for sharing your story, one that is all too common and very heartbreaking. Now, I understand that you have aged out of eligibility for an H-4 visa, um, the visa for spouses and children of H-1B visa holders. Can you just quickly share why that visa was so critical to you and your family? Thank you for your question, Congresswoman. The H-4, the, the dependent visa is the only thing that's kept me and my family together for 21 years. I've been in the United States since I was four months old. I've gone to school here. My parents and I have built a life here in our community. So it was really terrifying to think about the fact that once I turned 21, I would lose my H-4 visa and there was a chance that I couldn't be on the same continent as my parents. And this, this feeling is still pertinent today. Uh, because, because I've aged out, I don't know if my applications will be approved. Um, my future is really uncertain. I may have to leave the only place I call home. Thank you. Mr. Bayer, can someone like Ms. Matra follow all the rules and still lose their H4 status? Absolutely. Losing your H-4 status is built into being a dependent of an H-1B worker. As soon as you turn age 21, you can lose your status. And uh, ultimately, this is a, a component of the immigration system throughout. You can lose your status even if you do everything right. We've seen in uh, recent months how 91,000 spouses who are on an H-1, H-4 visa also lose their status and lose their work authorization because of delays at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So we already talked about how uh, these delays are impacting individuals, but at the end of the day, many people are losing their status in, the, in this country despite following every rule laid out for them in the law. Thank you, and very quickly, Mr. Yang, in December alone, women accounted for over 85% of jobs lost and Black, Hispanic, and Asian women accounted for all women's jobs lost that month. How does the experience of the H-4 workforce fit into this, and why is it so particularly devastating right now? now thank you for that question. Very briefly, 95% of H-4 visa holders are women, and at least 98% of them come from Asian countries. And because of some of these bureaucratic delays, as well as the COVID-19 problems, some of them have fallen out of status, and that results in a job loss to get back into the economy, and at the level that they were, they're losing literally a year or two years in their ability to be promoted and succeed in the business environment. Gentle ladies, time has expired, and we will now turn to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, for his questions. Well, I thank the chair. Uh, can you hear me okay, Madam Chair? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm in Fredericksburg, Texas, between the events. <laughs> And so I apologize. Uh, hopefully my signal stays strong. Um, appreciate all the guests here today uh, joining us, all the witnesses, uh, and the opportunity to have this hearing. Um, one question that, that I have, and I think that my friend from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, um, raised one of these questions. And, I, you know, Mr. Law, I think uh, you and he had an exchange uh, on, on along these lines. I want to make sure I heard it correctly. But how many people... Are the United States right, right now, legally, we are admitting over a million people a year. Is that correct? That's correct. One million permanent residents, green card holders uh, a year. And how long have we been at roughly that clip? I mean, in by my account, I mean, somewhere close to a decade. Is that right? I mean, certainly over five years or more. Oh, it's, it's longer than a decade, probably uh, going on close to 20 years. Um, and there's only been a few years where the numbers were, were lower than 1 million a year, and they were still in the high eights or, or low 900,000s. None of those years, of course, occurred under the Trump administration. So this notion that um, legal immigration was shut down is just completely um, not intellectually honest. 
about. Right. And so put, so putting aside for a moment, a lot of some of the issues my colleagues are raising and all of us, we all want an immigration system that works uh, smoothly. Um, I've had numerous friends over the years who have sought to try to come to the United States. Uh, yeah, I had a, a, a teammate of mine at the University of Virginia who was the first uh, black to win the South African Open. It was a big deal in, in golf, as you can imagine, a post-apartheid South Africa. Um, he and some of my other friends, were, another, another friend from Zimbabwe, to the country. it's all very difficult for friends. But your point, I think, that is important for this committee and this discussion, right, is that through all of that, we still have a plus who are coming into our country every year. Do you know, Mr. Trump, the answer to this, how many people met to other countries around the world each year? That's a big question. I realize that. Do you have any idea? Sure. So I don't have an itemized breakdown, but it's my understanding that the rest of the world combined offers what is the equivalent of our green card or permanent um, immigration status. Um, the combined, it is less than what we do on an annualized basis. Yeah, yeah and I actually would love to see you or any of the other witnesses there, and I'll, I'll ask my staff to look at it, but I don't, I don't have the exact number, but it's something like that, right? I mean, to uh, minimize the importance of a immigration system, the point of Mr. Biggs, we're and, and welcoming a million literally a year into the United States. Meanwhile, to the best of my understanding, correct me if these numbers are correct, we had, had 170,000 people apprehended in March along our southern border, uh, a little over 100,000, uh, another 70 something thousand in January, and we're waiting on. The April numbers, right? As the as the month of April here uh, winds down, we'll get the April numbers. But we're we're pushing uh, upwards of half a million for, over the first four months of this calendar year. Does that sound right in terms of apprehensions at our southern border? I lost you a little bit, but I, I believe if you're referencing the border apprehension numbers. Yes, it was roughly I believe seventy eight thousand uh, in January, up to one hundred and one thousand in February, which is a fifteen year high. And then it ballooned to 172,000 in, in March, all bucking the historical trend of border apprehensions going down at uh, this time of year. Right. I believe we will hear what the numbers are for April. But also, uh, not account what we call gotaways, right? That doesn't account for the people that are coming in between ports of entry or between, uh, you know, or who are getting through. Um, uh, at the ports of entry, uh, and and for example, in the Del Rio sector alone, uh, we know there were in the last month in March there was twenty six thousand uh, uh, cameras that caught movement of of activity of individuals moving across the border of, of twenty six thousand. That's just the Del Rio sector. Uh, in other words, there are certainly tens of thousands of people that are able to get into our country uh, between the ports of entry and illegally not being apprehended. Is that uh, do you understand that to be correct? That, that's correct. You'll never truly understand what the real denominator is because some are captured by camera, as you referenced, but others are just simply missed and they uh, were particularly good at, at coming across the border. Um, so, yeah, the border apprehensions is just a snapshot of an overall larger illegal alien population coming across the border. Okay. Um, and Madam Chair, I don't have a clock ticker on my thing, but and I want to be mindful of time, so I don't know where I am in five minutes. Your time is up. Congress, uh, could, I, could I answer your question real quick about the share of immigrants that come to the United States out of the share of all immigrants? Because it's actually only 10% of all, of all immigrants worldwide come to the United States in the last five years. So 10 times as many immigrants are going to other other countries then are coming to the United States. So it's, it's not correct that the United States allows more immigrants here than the rest of the world combined. That's that's just not correct. Uh, okay, well, well we, we, we can get that, Mr. Byer, we can get that number. I think what my point was gonna be, whatever the number is, we, we, we bring in a substantial portion of the immigrants around the world, of the, you know, seven point X billion people around the world, we have a substantial portion of that coming into the United States. Um, I'd like to know the firm number on that. You just said, you know, maybe we have 10 percent. So that means, you know, 10 million are immigrating into countries and we have a million of them. OK, that's that's fine. I'll, I'll accept that. We'll go look it up. My main point is just to say we're taking on a lion's share. 
I'd like to then see that list compared to every other country, itemized country by country. And I'd like to know then what that means in terms of overall burden and cost of us having a system to do all of that. I think these are important questions for us to understand. And the only other question I had for Mr. Law, and I'll wind down. Um, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, so if you could okay. wrap up. I, I don't want to cut you off prematurely, but just uh, your time has expired. So let's wrap, wrap it up quickly, if you could. <laughs> Understood, and I appreciate that graciousness. Quick question, Mr. Wall. Is it, do you believe it to be true that the increase in illegal immigration and if under the power of the cartels in our southern border is hampering legal immigration because the cartels are looking to funnel their traffic through their operations versus our legal uh, you know, paths? So a complicated question. I know it was a short amount of time uh, as we're over, but I uh, simply the whole situation, the border and the legal immigration system, they interplay against each other. You know, there are burdens and give and take on the whole thing. Uh, any activity that uh, encourages cartels and coyote behavior is, is problematic. Thank you. The gentleman's time is expired, more than expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we will turn now to Mr. Correa for his uh, questions. Lou, your your it is your time. Can you hear me okay, Madam Chair? Yes, we can, Lou. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank you for holding this most important hearing. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. And, and let me say that hearing this discussion reminds me of the debate we've been having 40, 50 years, maybe 100 years throughout the history of this country. And at the end of the day, we are a country of immigrants. I don't think there's any other place in the world that you can point to and say, you know, you are a country of immigrants. And, and you know, little secret here, essentially, we're all riffraff. We've all come to this country because our own country didn't want us there. So that's why we came to America with nothing but our dreams and our ability to work hard. Uh, Mr. Byer, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the labor stats because, you know, about about a year ago, I you know, I got a call from a lobbyist representing the poultry business. He was calling me because I was in this committee and wanted my help. He told me a story where down in the Deep South, 600 poultry workers had gotten deported, bringing the whole poultry industry, the whole county to a standstill, the economy. And he told me, he said, Lou, we can't get workers. And he said, it's not about wages. He said, they're all members of the Food and Commercial, United Food and Commercial Workers Union. We just can't get people to come in and do these jobs. And, you know, you think about the comments that have been made today, and I guess you look at numbers, and you can do whatever you want to do with numbers. But, you know, in California, the fifth largest economy in the world, heavily dependent on immigrants, skilled and unskilled. You know, we, we're going through a pandemic. You know, we talk about the unemployment numbers. But I went out there and I visited farm workers working under what we could call dangerous conditions. But nonetheless, they were working to feed us under these conditions. And, and you look at Silicon Valley, you look at the pharmaceutical industry, the medical device industry. What will we do without skilled and unskilled workers? Do we have a labor shortage in this country? What is going on? Do these immigrants hurt Americans? Please, Mr. Byer. No, they absolutely do not hurt Americans. And, you know, it was said that there's no job American won't do. And that's certainly true. But when it comes to farm labor and and uh, meat and poultry processing and other industries, there's no unemployed Americans who are seeking out these jobs. In fact, a study was done of farm workers in North Carolina, for example, uh, at the height of the recession in North Carolina in 2011, there were more than 500,000 unemployed North Carolinians. The H-2A program advertised to those, jo those jobs at the prevailing wage uh, for multiple months to those unemployed Americans. And only seven of those applicants, U.S. workers, actually came on and stayed throughout the entire season. So there is a need for, for uh, foreign workers to come in and, and fill some of these slots. Uh, under the H-2B program, we see the same thing. We have 100,000 uh, labor certified, uh, Department of Labor certified positions that are unfilled right now that uh, need workers. And yet uh, we're hearing that we don't have uh, any way to get them into the country. So it's a major issue right now. 
right now, you know, some of the numbers are out of date. Today, we have more open jobs in this country than before the start of the pandemic. So yes, unemployment is high, but guess what? We're still in the middle of the pandemic. Many people are still afraid to go out to work, but immigrants are willing to go out and, and work these jobs and we should let them because it's harmful to our economy not to allow it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Byer. Very quickly, Ms. Monte, I wanted to ask you, you're an individual that America needs. You come, you educate yourself in the STEM area, a scientist, a healthcare worker, these are the areas that America has the edge on technology. We, we make the best pharmaceuticals, the best medical instruments, the best medicines. This is where I see your role. The doctors at the local hospital, a lot of them are immigrants. And yet we have this issue of not letting you into our country. Why in God's name would we take somebody smart like you, intelligent like you, give you all this education, all this training, and then tell you, thank you very much, thank you, but go away, we don't want you anymore. We, I just, it's crazy. What do you think? Could you enhance our country with your skills? Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I, I just wanna say I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had that my university has given me. Um, however, it hurts when um, I'm not able to fulfill my goals or give back to the community that has done so much for me. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Sparks is next, but the rules require Ms. Sparks for your camera to be on. Could you please turn on your camera and be recognized for your questions? Ms. Sparks, there you are. You're now recognized. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. I think it's a very important conversation and I appreciate we having this conversation. Uh, as, a as a legal immigrant myself, I truly believe we have a lot of work to improve our legal immigration system, improve our legal infrastructure, and also um, looking how we can really streamline some of these policies that better serve our country and provide less bureaucracy, including maybe some visas policy and work visa policies. There is a lot of work to do in this area, but it's also important that we have a secure border with, uh, we have a border policy and an issue with um, national security. So uh, I think it's important for us to have this conversation. So it seems to me that we don't have it very often and um, we don't have in a productive way. So hopefully our committee can work on that because it's not a, you know, you cannot resolve all of this with really just, you know, doing one bill. So um, my question is going to be related to, um, Really, I can ask, you know, several of, you know, and if any fan volunteer from our panel people, what is there are some things you believe that Republicans and Democrats can agree on that we can provide streamline legal immigration system and provide border security and national security on the border? You know, is there is any things we can find a common ground or we can never, because it seems like I am frustrated with a lot of people. We've been discussing for years, and I'm sure Madam Chair has been on this committee for a long time, but nothing happens. And we keep discussing, we keep discussing, and I'll be honest with you, what's happening on the border, it breaks my heart. It's a very uh, disturbing situation, and it didn't happen overnight, but it's escalated recently. So we have to have good policy. We have to be able to work as a branch and then work and put pressure on executive branch to actually, you know, to actually get stuff done and work with us. So any anyone on the committee uh, wants to mention just quickly, what do you think? Do you think there's a hope that something can be done? Ms. Sparks, if, if I could interrupt, last Congress, 365 members of the House voted to make adjustments on the per country cap limitation, not to eliminate it completely. It was a huge bipartisan 
vote uh, in the House, and the Senate kind of mucked it up. But that was an example of bipartisan effort. Mr. Buck was the principal uh, co- uh, and, and then maybe we need to work better with the Senate. And I have a view that the Senate always rules the show, right? And, you know, I have a problem. We should be. We actually represent the people. They represent the state. But I don't know. We have, uh, you know, Mr. Law, he's, you know, he's worked a lot of policy issues. Do you want to mention something? Do you think there is something that actually can happen and go to the Senate, too, and be signed by the president? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Well, you should, started. Yes, thank you. Well, first off, we should absolutely uh, fix the TVPRA and Flores settlement um, loopholes in the law. Even President Obama back in 2014 pleaded with Congress to do that, uh, and Congress failed to act. Uh, if we do not enforce our laws and remove the incentives for economic migrants and other vulnerable um, people to put themselves in harm's way through coyotes, and drug cartels to come here um, when they don't have a, a mechanism other than just coming across the border. We've got to, we've got to stop that. You've got to cut off this uh, link to, to the cartels. Uh, and unfortunately, regarding the, the per country caps, while yes, it did pass with a uh, broad bipartisan support, I think there's fundamental misunderstanding about what that bill does. Uh, it would be a train wreck to the legal immigration system. And frankly, it would reward those in the tech industry in particular who have replaced and displaced American workers by utilizing the H-1B program first, uh, which does not require you to actually seek out Americans first. And then they only petition for Indian males to overload the system because there is no per country cap on H-1B. Congress confused the whole system by creating this concept of dual intent where you can have both non-immigrant, meaning temporary, and immigrant, meaning permanent intent at the same time. The blending of those two things together has unfortunately created a mess that, that is too often just destroying the system. And, and frankly, that is why the per country caps are in place. We need to have clear distinctions between permanent immigration and temporary immigration, which is why things like alien and immigrant are important legal terms because those distinctions matter very much. I yield back. If you have a second, if you can mention just something quickly. And Madam Chair, if she allows me a couple of seconds. Of course. Uh, the gentlelady uh, yields back. I appreciate her question. And we now turn to Ms. Garcia uh, for her five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all the witnesses that are here today. And uh, Madam Chair, for holding this critical hearing. When it comes to immigration, as you said, Everyone always asks, why don't they just get in line like everybody else? But the truth of the matter is that there is no everybody else because of unduly burdensome barriers to immigration that make it impossible to where there is no general purpose line, or as one of the witnesses said, there is a lot of weights everywhere. Like many of my colleagues have called for comprehensive immigration reform for many, many years. Uh, but today, uh, we, have, we have before us uh, a lot of questions that are being asked about wait lists, backlogs, because the reality is that USCIS provides on its website that the estimated time range is 5 to 17 months of processing time for an immigrant who applies for a green card at the Texas Service Center. Not long ago, the national average processing time for citizenship had increased by 80%. Here in Houston, the median wait time was 14 months over a year, and processing could take up 25 months. That's two years. What's more is that the number of immigrant visa cases pending interviews at the National Visa Center increased by 473,000. While green card wait times were already at a steep rise, COVID-19 has made it worse. The surge to unprecedented levels. So the bottom line is we need change and we need it now. I want to start with you, Mr. Byer. Um, you know, we've said over and over, and I think a couple of my colleagues have even used the word, you know, we are the most generous country in the world on immigration. Can you really give us some context in light of the many barriers for pathways into really getting there? I know they keep talking about this one million uh, green cards. Uh, but the truth is 65% of those were based on some um, a green card going to a relative. So 
just quickly some of the barriers, and uh, I would like it at the, the one minute mark, Madam Chair, yield to my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Ross, for, for a question. Ultimately, if you don't have a family member in the United States and you don't have a college degree, you're pretty much shut out of the immigration system in the United States. Uh, we have a system where, that basically assigns people uh, by random lottery uh, you know, that you have almost no chance of winning. We are one of the largest countries in the world. We are the third largest country in the world. So the idea that one million should sound impressive to anyone, it's just not, uh, it's not impressive. It's one million out of 330 million people. That's less than one third of a percent of our population. O overall, compared to other countries, controlling for the population size, we rank 61st in the world for our foreign born share of the population. We're bottom third among wealthy countries. We're fourth to last among OECD countries for employment-based immigration. And we're not even in the top 50 countries worldwide for refugee or an asylum intake uh, per capita. Even if the US increased its legal immigration system fivefold for the next decade, we still wouldn't have a foreign born share of the population equal to the share in Australia or Canada or New Zealand or Switzerland. So the idea that the United States is letting in some absurd number of people that's totally abnormal uh, for a developed country is just not true. Um, Ms. Garcia, you have a minute and 11 seconds. Do you wish to yield to Ms. Ross now? To uh, put a document on record, it's called Immigrants Applying for Citizenship in Houston is high wait time. That, uh, without objection, that would be made a part of the record. Ms. Ross, you are recognized. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Garcia and Chairwoman Lofgren. I'm honored to be here and make this um, visit to your subcommittee because I want to advocate for documented dreamers like Ms. Matre and her colleagues at Improve the Dream. My district in the Research Triangle area of North Carolina depends on highly skilled, highly educated foreign workers to fill jobs in technology and biotech. These workers bring their families to my district, build their lives here and make our communities better. And our, com our economy is booming because of them. So I wanna thank you, Ms. Matre. I wanna thank you and I wanna thank your family. We need these workers and their families to help our nation maintain its status as a world leader in innovation. And um, I will close just by saying, if you want to go to a committee that can really agree on the need for these workers, come to the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, because we want you to stay in our country, and we welcome you. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Uh, uh, General Lady, uh, Ms. Uh, Garcia yields back. And uh, now I'm pleased to recognize the General Lady from Texas, Ms. Escobar. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm so grateful for this hearing and for this opportunity. Um, I want to just say a few things before I ask my question. What we're seeing today and have seen for years at the southern border in safe and secure communities like my own is unfortunately the consequence of America's failed approach to immigration. For decades, we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on hardening our border, on costly and ineffective walls, and during the past administration, using cruelty as a deterrent. At the same time, our country has limited, and in the eyes of many, essentially eliminated legal pathways. So we shouldn't be at all surprised that as legal pathways shrink, irregular or undocumented immigration grows. What we should have learned by now is that the short-sighted approaches of the past not only do not work, but they dehumanize immigrants and they debase us. I frequently hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle cynically say that they support legal immigration. And yet they say this knowing full well that those legal pathways have continued to shrink and for many are non-existent. At the beginning of this hearing, we heard the ranking member preach that we should continue the same failed approaches of the past. I'll recount that old saying for him, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. It's long past time that we recognize that immigrants are a net positive for our economy. And after the results from the Census Bureau recently, we should recognize that we need them. 
I wanna take a moment to highlight the story of, of how we've eliminated pathways for people. One of my constituents, Edgar Falcon, has been living the reality of permanent family separation for the last decade. Edgar, a US citizen, met his now wife in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. His wife later applied for a visa and was denied over an incident that occurred when she was a teenager. An adult took her to a port of entry and encouraged her to present false documents in order to enter the United States. This decision she made as a child resulted in a permanent bar to accessibility. There are no waivers for a situation like this and therefore no, no forgiveness. Edgar has been splitting his time between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, where he and his, uh, where his wife and daughter live, but they can't be together. Edgar is one of 1.3 million US citizens whose families have been permanently separated over a denied spousal visa or the removal of a spouse from the country. I ask unanimous consent to Edgar Edgar's, enter Edgar <laughs> into the record. Without objection, the uh, material will be in the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be reintroducing the American Families United Act this week, a bill that will help families like Edgar's, and I hope my colleagues will co-sponsor. Mr. Byer, um, I really was so interested in the Cato Institute's um, uh, survey polling results that, that, that you provided us this week. Um, I want to get back to something that you talked about and, and something that, that we're grappling with, the visa backlogs in our immigration system. What would a more efficient system look like? What should Congress do to begin to address this issue? So, as the chair said, the most important thing is fairness in the system. So everyone should be treated equally without regard to their birthplace. But ultimately, Congress does need to address the fact that there are not enough green cards for the demand uh, from around the world. And we need these people. And so ultimately, we need to create a flexible immigration system that evolves with our economy and society. So the idea that we should have a hard cap on the number of employment-based green cards makes no sense in a modern economy where demand could change overnight. A new industry could be born tomorrow. We don't even know what it is. And yet we're deciding in Congress right now how many green cards we're going to have 10 years from now. We're, we're dealing with a cap that's 30 years old. And yet the idea that we can't make any tweaks to that magical number uh, makes no sense. Uh, no economist would agree with it. It's it's really counterproductive. And so I would argue we need a flexible cap or or have the cap eliminated entirely because every single person that we're keeping out would be a huge asset to our economy right now. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And Mr. Byer, I want to follow up with you uh, beyond this hearing to have this continue this conversation. And I'll just close. Um, there, there was a mention of intellectual dishonesty earlier by Mr. Law when he and um, my colleague, one of my colleagues, Mr. Roy, were talking about border encounters and apprehensions. We need to talk about this honestly. Um, and those numbers, uh, just for the public's sake, include uh, numbers of recidivists. In other words, policies in place like Title 42 that cause people to attempt multiple times to uh, come into our country. So those numbers sound, you know, they're, they're intended to sound scary to folks, but they don't reflect adequately what is truly happening. Madam Speaker, I yield back. The lady yields back. The other gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee is now recognized. Madam Chair, thank you. And to the ranking member, thank you so very much. Um, I would almost say, uh, for some of us, this is down memory lane, a memory lane that we wish we did not have to repeat. Uh, but I'm grateful that we are moving uh, forward. And I'd like to really think that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So let me thank all the witnesses, first of all, for their testimony. Uh, and let me share some thoughts. Um, Madam Chair, I am not seeing the five minutes, so please forgive me. I'm just going to try and move as quickly as possible. But I do want to get uh, this particular information into the record. Uh, Texas uh, immigrants that are in our particular state uh, 40, own 43,500 homes in Texas and pay 340,500,000 annual mortgage payments, and their households contribute uh, two trillion, uh, two two billion, two hundred thirty-four 
million eight hundred thousand in federal taxes and one billion two hundred sixty five thousand in state and local taxes just for our uh, information uh, and as well uh, 10 billion in spending power in Texas. That's just uh, in Texas uh, and I imagine we could repeat some of these numbers all over the nation. So and these immigrants by the way come from all over the world. Uh, Houston has found itself in Harris County one of the most diverse cities in the nation. Our friends from Southeast Asia uh, Latinx, Hispanic, uh, from Africa in particular as well, each having their individual from the Mideast, uh, from Iran, uh, from uh, various other places in uh, the Mideast, uh, from Israel. Uh, immigrants come from everywhere contributing their own talents. I'm wondering uh, why there is such an apprehension and fear. So I'm going to raise my questions in that context, if I might, and uh, Congresswoman Escobar has moved me uh, to be able to speak of a Palestinian family uh, that I worked with immediately after 9-11. Uh, they had had a loss in their family. By the way, they owned a flag store. The flag store was making American flags. There were nine members, and most of the children had been born in the United States. That's how long they had been, and their youngest child as well. They had a death in their community. Uh, and uh, the block that they lived on, there were many Muslims coming in their attire. They might have been praying uh, out and around uh, because of the loss in their family, a Muslim loss. They were saying their prayers. Uh, and so a neighbor called the uh, authorities and said terrorists were gathering for a meeting. This was right after 9-11. I understand that uh, to the extent that one might be sympathetic. That family was rounded up with their American store, uh, their parents were not citizens, their children were, and we worked and worked and worked uh, with an effort to try and secure their ability to stay so that they could uh, status themselves. Uh, and ultimately, they were deported to Jordan, uh, first to Canada, then to Jordan. But the hardship uh, and break on that family was enormous. I want to ask uh, both uh, Mr. Yang uh, and Mr. Byer in particular, and I'll start with Mr. Byer. And I do want to say um, I join with the Congresswoman uh, Perrine to find every way to ensure that you can stay in this nation, this country, your country, and to make sure that you can get the interns and fellowships you want. Let me just quickly ask Mr. Yang and Mr. Byer, because I've heard this before. Can you, through me, speak to the fears that are being expressed by my friends on the other side of the aisle? How do you address that fear? for us to be able to move in a bipartisan way realistically to solve uh, this inadequate immigration system. Let me start with Mr. Bayer first, please. Do you hear me? Oh, I, I think we can think of a, a number of different ways to address the concern. I mean, the main concern that I'm hearing from the other side is that there are just too many people who want to come to this country. Um, I, I don't share that concern at all. I think more people contributing to this country would make us a stronger economy, a stronger country. If you look at our share of GDP, it's declined by 50 percent uh, out of the share of world GDP over the last 50 years. So the U.S. influence is declining as a result of these limits on immigration. But I do think that uh, we can find agreement in certain areas. The majority in this, uh, this uh, current committee passed an ag workforce bill. We also had an ag workforce bill passed by the last uh, majority, uh, uh, Representative Goodlatte's bill. And we could find common ground about that and ultimately see that pass into law. Don Yang, could you? Uh, Mr. Byer provides some good statistics. Let me give you two stories. One is Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss was brought here to the country because of one of his siblings. He came here with nothing in his pockets and built an iconic American brand. Let me talk about Yahoo. Jerry Yang was brought here to the country by one of his siblings, brought an iconic American brand. That's the value that immigrants and family immigration brings to this country. If you only can see our way clear, and that would include African uh, immigrants as well, who come and have a strong emphasis on science and medicine and building the economy. I hope my friends on the other side can hear that because I do think we can find a pathway forward. I think Madam Chair, don't know my time at this point, and actually has expired. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so very much with that, Ms. Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady, Ms. Scanlon, is now recognized. 
Thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren, for, for hosting this important conversation. I was so interested to read the title of today's conversation because it's become such a cliched response. Whenever the broken nature of our immigration system intrudes on the news, the idea that people seeking admission to the U.S. should get in line or wait their turn becomes a go-to talking point for folks who don't really understand how complex our immigration system has become. Often the lack of understanding goes back to their personal family history, whether decades or generations ago, which was often vastly different and didn't involve navigating the complicated quotas and application processes or waiting decades for a visa. So the reality is our immigration system today is incredibly slow and complex. Uh, refugees are waiting decades for a chance to join their families in the U.S. Talented workers are choosing to work in other countries be, so that they can more easily bring their spouses and children. And of course, dreamers and TPS holders are left confused by complicated and regrettably changing guidance. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to hear from experts about the changes that Congress could make because we really have to simplify and reform our immigration process. Um, Mr. Yang, I think your testimony talked a little bit about the decades long backlogs for family based um, in green cards. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe compare how that those backlogs impact people from different areas or or people today versus even a decade or two ago? Absolutely. And thank you for that question. Certainly the backlogs do affect us differently depending on where you're from. So if you're talking about countries like Mexico, Philippines, India, China, uh, those countries have the longest backlog, especially when you talk about the sibling category, we're talking about over two decades when it comes to family-based immigration. So it's, it, I think uh, Mr. Byer talked about this as perhaps an unusable system as it currently exists. And that's exactly right, is we need to update the system from where it was 30 years ago. Well, one thing to go to what Representative Sparks was asking about is what are some fixes that we could offer that, that make sense or that are efficient. One thing that could be offered is ending the count of derivatives. And what I mean by derivatives is spouses and immediate children of a, a person that is applying for a visa. Right now, they're counted towards these caps, towards these, these numbers. If we exclude them from the numbers, then we start to get rid of the backlog. We start to streamline the system. Reclassifying spouses, permanent partners, and minor children of green card holders and immediate relatives. That's another way that you start to move some move some of these backlogs. Last thing I would offer that certainly is, it, it, it is something that, whether it's Congress potentially, administratively you could do, is recapturing immigrant visas that were unused because of bureaucratic delays, because of administrative delays. There's been a number of unused visas from back to, I think, as far back as 1992 that we could recapture. And then that could streamline that process to start to reduce those backlogs. Oh, thank you for that. That's really interesting. I, I did have experience with representing a woman who our State Department honored as a hero for um, from Darfur, who was repeatedly kidnapped and tortured and spent decades in a um, displaced persons camp where her parents and siblings remain. And there is nothing she can do to try to reunite with her family. She cannot return there or she'll be murdered. And, and she cannot bring them them here. And it's it's truly, truly heartbreaking. Um, Mr. Beer, um, I hear all the time from academic and medical and research institutions in my district that, that our system and particularly the rules regarding H-1B visas and work authorization for spouses are really impeding our economic efforts and our research and development efforts um, and, and really hurting you know, a lot of our medical progress, et cetera. Can you um, address um, the consequences to the U.S. economy and to Americans if we don't address some of these issues? Look, we are already losing out uh, dramatically as a result of our broken immigration system. Uh, India has already surpassed us in terms of software exports um, in the world economy. Um, you're talking about biomedical expertise. The United States is losing out there. We know that the, all of the companies that were working on vaccines, uh, all of them were employing H-1B workers. Many of their spouses are ineligible from, work, from working until they enter the green card process. And now we have Trump era rules that are preventing those spouses from being able to renew their work authorization. So we've had 91,000 lose their work authorization over the last year. 
all of those people are working in high skilled industries and occupations and we're disemploying them and causing this huge upset in the high skills sector. So ultimately, I think uh, Congress needs to step in. They need to have congressional authorization and mandates uh, to make sure that we are treating our high skilled workforce like the assets that they are. Ultimately, no country on earth treats their high skilled immigrants as poorly as the United States does. So it's no wonder so many are going to other countries. We're seeing immigration, Indian immigration to Canada in the last five years has doubled. And so it's not surprising that the United States can lose out on many innovators and entrepreneurs. And I think I've even heard other countries, uh, such as President Macron, um, actively courting folks who, who aren't able to stay here. I see my time has expired, so I yield back. Thank you. The lady yields back, and I now um, will start with my questions. You know, I, I think about a lot of, you know, Americans are great people, and I've heard people say, you know, my family immigrated the right way, and that's all we want. And I think about... My grandfather, he immigrated the right way at the time, and that process was this. He got on a boat, the boat sailed to America, and he got off the boat. That was the whole process, and it's what served the United States at the time. We now have a very complicated system, and the question is, does it serve the United States' interests or not? When I think about the, the backlogs in family immigration, if you're a legal permanent resident of the United States, and you petition for your spouse. Ultimately, you and your spouse are going to be um, reunited, but there may be some delay. So what value does it give to the United States to separate a spouses for a period of years? I don't see what, what value that yields to the United States. And we ought to fix that because we set the rules. I think also about the uh, employment-based and, and yes, we had the national origin bill, but we have a version of that now. If you take a look at the visa allocation, Western Europe has 25 countries, some very tiny, Liechtenstein. Um, the population of Western Europe is about 196 million people, and they get no more than 7% per country. Yet if you look at India with a population of 1.36 uh, billion, they get the same allocation as Liechtenstein. Now, I don't think that's a neutral allocation, and I think it harms the United States uh, because the gentle lady is right. We have recruiters down here uh, from Canada uh, taking people who are hot shots, waiting in interminable lines, and they're leaving. They're going to Toronto, which is why the Toronto tech economy is growing faster than Silicon Valley today. So we need to figure out what's good for America, what serves American interests as we look at writing the laws. I'd like to talk to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Beer, if you would, on the um, per country cap issue. Obviously, the, the broader issue is making sure that we have enough visas to meet the need, and that relates to both scrutinizing that we have an adequate uh, test to make sure that Americans are not displaced, that the person who is to be hired, in fact, is, is an important uh, goal and win for the American economy. We may want to do that. But if that hurdle is passed, how do we make sure uh, by adjusting the caps that we don't actually hurt others. You know, people are concerned if you adjust relative to the biggest companies, somehow um, others will be left out when, in fact, the bill that we have worked with the Senate on doesn't completely eliminate the cap. It just adjusts it downward uh, to 75 percent. Can you address that issue? Well, the issue you're talking about is ultimately the consequence of the backlog and the per country caps is that almost all of the people in the backlog are from India. So if we do it on a first in, first out basis, then Indians are going to be processed first and new applicants will go to the back of the line. That's, in my opinion, that's a completely fair system, but there are other issues at stake. And so there is a transition process provided in the bill that enables a transition over time to, to phase out 
these country caps. But at, at the end of the day, a, a fair process is treating everyone as individuals, knowing what the process is going to be when you apply. And uh, taking into account birthplace is just not a reasonable basis for an immigration system. I, I just, we had a report, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put the report in the record, but the Joint Economic Committee uh, has, has prepared a report on immigrants in the U.S. economy, and they report that 29% of physicians in the United States are foreign-born, and that 25% of new firms in the United States were started by immigrants. I'm just wondering, by failing to provide for a lawful status for needed uh, physicians and for people who want to start companies in the United States, what damage, in, in your judgment, does that do to the American economy and to American workers? Mr. Beer, if you can address that. It does incredible damage. And if you look forward, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says these are going to be the, some of the fastest growing occupations dealing with the aging of our society. As the elderly population grows, we're going to need more physicians. We're going to need more home health aides. And uh, home health aides are even more overrepresented by the immigrant population. They're almost 40 percent uh, foreign born. So we need these uh, workers right now, particularly dealing with the demographic situation. Uh, that our country faces. The Social Security Administration is telling us we need workers to fund Social Security. So at the end of the day, I think you have to say that our system is too constrained given the moment in time right now. We have to address the challenges of our economy, and one of those is expanding the legal immigration system. I see that my time has expired, and so I will uh, stop my questions. We do know that the record is open uh, for the next five days for additional questions that may be uh, directed to our witnesses. And we ask if those um, questions are um, directed to you, that you please answer them promptly. I would also like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record uh, statements from uh, 16 organizations and 20 uh, five individuals, four individuals who've asked that their statements be made part of the record, and without objection, that will be done. Uh, this concludes uh, today's hearing, and I'd like to thank once again uh, our panel of witnesses for participating in this hearing. You've helped advance our understanding of this complex issue, uh, and without objection, as I said, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written material or questions for the witnesses. And unless there is objection, this hearing is now adjourned.